and you can always come back and watch it. All right, welcome everybody. You are at the session for study abroad for history and political science majors. Hope you found your way to the right link for this day. And I hope you've been able to attend a couple other sessions if they're relevant to you as well. Um, it's been great to be able to do this in this format, a little bit more spread out um, than our normal study abroad fair. Um, but we hope that it will help you connect to the programs that are most relevant to you, or at least get started on your research and understand what UNC has to offer for no matter what your major might be. Um, study abroad doesn't have to be decided based on your major. There are lots of other experiences that you might have, but when you're talking about trying to get some major credits abroad, it certainly alleviates some of the stress that you have about strategizing um, which program and which terms to be abroad. So. We hope this will be helpful to you, and I will give an overview of some of the recommended programs that we have for history and political science majors, and then I'll talk a little bit about some of the just basics of studying abroad and, and how to apply and funding and all of that fun stuff. Um, I'll be happy to take questions at the end, um, and of course, we are available to you if you have other questions throughout your process. To introduce myself, my name is Gina DeFino. I manage study abroad programs and fellowships for Honors Carolina. Um, Honors Carolina works in close partnership with the study abroad office as we manage a lot of faculty led study abroad programs, both in the semester and in the summer term. So they're um, unique opportunities, but they're open to all UNC students. So just because they're managed by Honors Carolina does not mean they're exclusive to students in Honors Carolina. Um, the only requirement for all of our classes on campus or abroad is a 3.0 GPA. So just so you know, everybody can study abroad with Honors Carolina, and we do work in close partnership with the study abroad office. All right, here we go. Some of the benefits of study abroad are, are general to anybody who would take the opportunity to study abroad. Um, you can gain real world experience that's tied to your career path. Sometimes this will be for, for history and poli sci, this might be a very practical research um, oriented questions. It can be with courses that you're looking for for your academics. Um, it can be in lots of different modes. So study abroad isn't just one thing. There are lots of different ways and experiences that you could have while you're studying abroad. Um, secondly, we think it's essential for everybody to develop further cross-cultural competence skills. Um, this is something that can be done at home, but it is in far sharper relief when you are living in a place that um, helps you understand that different people in a different place have set up different ways of being in the world and different systems. And so you get to understand those different perspectives in a very real way when you are immersed in that environment. And then um, thirdly, you should always be building new personal skills that are relevant and transferable to any environment that you may find yourself in um, after your collegiate career. Curiosity, flexibility, confidence, independence, creativity are all tied with studying or all tied with studying abroad. So we would encourage it for lots of different reasons, but some of them are very, very practical reasons about how you see the world and what you can contribute in whatever organization you find yourself in after you graduate. <clears throat> Let's look at some of our recommended programs before we get into some of the general study abroad things that we were going to talk about. Um, one program that's an Honors Carolina program that we're very proud of and see lots of history majors participate in is our Honors Semester in London. Um, this tends to be a popular program for students of a variety of different majors, partially because of the mixed academic and professional focus of the program. Um, students will earn 13 to 15 UNC graded credits on the program, and you can see the courses that are offered on the right side. Um, the one at the top, the Comparative US and UK Health Systems course, that is only offered this coming fall of 2022 because the faculty director who is coming from UNC is from the Gilling School of Global Public Health. But 
The other courses are offered every semester and um, students generally participate in the internship track, which is taking three seminars of that list in addition to um, doing a customized internship in an area of study. So we have had several students um, interning across the board in different types of organizations, including um, media organizations, um, advertising agencies, museums, um, a, whole, a whole variety of different organizations. So um, it's an interesting program. You can get lots of gen ed credits in addition to some of the credits that you see here, um, along with some practical experience in a customized internship. That runs in the fall and the spring term. So these are the dates for the upcoming fall term. Um, a summer program that we offer is called Exploration, Colonialism, and Violence in the UK and Ireland. This program's run, I believe, two times before. It's um, fantastic. It's um, run by Wayne Lee from the History Department. And I believe that these courses also would get you credit in PWOD as well as, um, as, well as history. Um, what's great about it is that you are learning primarily about US colonialism um, and exploration through resources that are in the UK and Ireland. As you can imagine, a lot of uh, the colonization that happened here was from the perspective of the UK. Um, so you're connecting with UNC's Winston House, which is where you'll take your classes right in central London, and you'll get to do some um, original research on this program, which I think is a really great benefit for students in history. Um, it's, it's fantastic to be able to do some archival research there. Um, a new program that we're offering in political science is nationalism and identity in the UK. So looking at themes of nationalism and immigration and, and the rise of nationalism in the UK is very interesting and I think instructive um, in a comparative sense as well. So looking at it on the island of um, uh, on England and Scotland, you get to actually see um, different settings and how they understand their national identity and, and how it's complicated by, um, by immigration and, and it's fantastic. Um, Jeff spinner Halev is currently in London. He's the faculty director for our honor semester in London this semester and um, will be teaching this program this coming summer um, in the like generally May master period. So mid-May to mid-June. Another program that is a summer program that tends to be popular and strong for history or poli sci majors is through the University of Sydney in Australia. Um, currently, Australia is still closed to visitors, but we have understood that they are planning to open their doors to students. So we are hopeful that that program will run this coming summer. And then there are a host of semester programs that would suit history and poli sci majors, just based on some of the courses that have transferred back in the past and some of the opportunities that might be available. So I'm not going to read through all of them, but as you can see, um, there are programs that would be represented um, on all continents, um, depending on your personal interests in, in which area, which regional history or um, political systems that you might be interested in. All right, let me go back into more general topics about studying abroad. Now that you know some of the programs that we're really excited about for this coming um, summer and fall application cycle, which just opened this week, let's talk a little bit about academics and credit. While you're abroad, you can get all sorts of different kinds of credit, elective credits, gen ed credits. Um, all programs offer the experiential education program. So even if, um, even if a course like a UNC course doesn't normally have the EE designation for gen ed, any study abroad program that is hosting that course will have that for, for that term. 
Um, and you can also get major minor requirements as well as your language requirements abroad, but um, those are really important to understand that you need departmental approval for any of those courses. Um, the Study Abroad Office has already put together a pretty extensive database of courses that are, have been previously approved for departmental approval um, and will continue to add to that database as more students um, request courses to be transferred back and request that the departments review those courses. We do recommend that you meet with an academic advisor before you apply, because sometimes there are degree programs um, that strategically would want you to study abroad earlier in your academic career. Some of them, the earlier courses are very heavily sequenced and it's better to study abroad later in your academic career. Um, so I, I would strongly recommend thinking about what kind of credit you want while you're abroad and then meeting with an academic advisor before making final decisions about that. One thing that I wanted to note on this last bullet is that if you take a UNC program abroad, those are all UNC credits. So even if you have a high number of transfer credit hours already, those programs are UNC credits. So they're not transfer credits. They don't count against that cap. Um, you will be enrolled at UNC for the semester that you're doing a UNC program. And therefore we actually often see students um, participate in multiple programs even that are UNC programs because those credits are UNC credits. The study abroad website is a great resource for anything that you need to know about study abroad. It has resources um, for academics, for advising, financial aid, parents and family. It has an FAQ section for each term. Um, so I would strongly recommend that you uh, take some time to, to look for your answers there. And then the actual application portal where you can find all of the programs is through heelsabroad.unc.edu. You can of course access that from the main study abroad page, but if you want to do just cut to the chase and look for the programs, um, that's the site that you would go to. There's a program search feature that can help you explore programs. And then you'll actually apply to the program through that same portal. And I'll show you what it looks like in just a second. So here's like your program search tool. Once you're inside that healsabroad.unc.edu, you can search for the program name, but maybe it's not the name you're looking for. So you can go to a more advanced search and look at any of these different types of features for the programs. Um, maybe you want a program feature of an internship. So you see that in this parameters down here, there's like, you can select internship, or maybe you're looking for field study. Uh, maybe you're looking for research um, and you don't care which region you're, you're studying abroad in. So those are different ways where you can play around with some of the search functions to help you identify a list of programs that work for you. I understand that you can also save some programs. So if you wanted to go back and look at them later, you could you know, basically like favorite a selection of programs so that you can come back to it um, before you actually apply. Health and safety has been top of mind, particularly um, in COVID times and, and with it impacting study abroad so, uh, so much over the past year and a half. We're really excited, but we have a fine-tuned understanding of how to proceed considering the risks that we're seeing. Um, the Study Abroad Office actually has been sending students abroad since fall 2021, um, just to a smaller number of countries that either had better control over the COVID um, pandemic um, or that had um, incredible support for students and the ability to, to still welcome students on their campuses. So understanding that all travel involves some level of risk. We are taking a lot of different factors um, to, to help mitigate those risks. Some of those include the following. Um, there are virtual study abroad programs still. So many students have been taking advantage of virtual study abroad or online programs um, and partnerships with institutions abroad. Um, we have a pretty strongly developed risk assessment matrix, which helps us determine whether a program will be viable for our students in an upcoming term. We meet with all students pre-departure to make sure that we are briefing them on how to maintain health and safety because each region is managing the COVID pandemic very differently. And actually, I think that's one of the main things that we're, we can learn through um, studying abroad through this pandemic. 
And then we are making some itinerary changes to programs um, if we believe that that will make them either safer or more viable um, going forward. So some multi-site programs may have been reduced to um, one or two sites so that in case of any quarantine or um, isolation challenges, we can still support all students on those programs. If you want to keep in touch, there's a monthly newsletter that the Study Abroad Office puts out. You can sign up for it on the bottom of the homepage. It's not very frequent, as you can see, it's just a monthly newsletter that highlights what's upcoming and, and certain um, programs that you might be interested in, as well as student stories. Um, but I do find that a lot of students have enjoyed the Instagram feed for UNC Study Abroad. We have a lot of student takeovers who um, will show you kind of what it looks like on the ground in their program. And I think that's always a fun, a fun way to engage with the possibilities of study abroad. Um, there are student spotlights both on the website homepage and through Instagram and Facebook. So by all means, engage where, where you find it best. And then the website also has FAQs um, and there are events that go through either Facebook or the website so you can see when upcoming information sessions are or what the policies are surrounding your program term that you'd like to be studying abroad. Um, I believe I have a student who has studied abroad as a history major, I believe who's attending. Are you here? Yes, I believe that is me. Yes, hi, Allison. Sorry, I wanted to make sure. Um, so Allison, how about you just walk us through this slide and tell us a bit more about your experience and, and in my opinion, particularly how you made the decision to study abroad, where you did and how you did. Absolutely. So hello, everyone. My name is Allison Holbrooks. I am a history major, double majoring with journalism, but I did study abroad focusing on history. I am a senior and I got to study in the UK doing the King's College program, which was just a direct exchange program where I was just enrolled at that university. So how are the classes different? I think the style of teaching is a little different in the UK. I'm only speaking to the UK. Obviously, there are a lot of different teaching styles across the world, and I'm sure all of y'all are looking all over the place, which is really cool. Um, specifically, a lot of the classes are much more discussion based. I was definitely taking more history focused courses. So every single class you would come in with like reading materials that you had already gone through and prepared notes on. Then it was typically just like a proctor led like discussion about those materials and then introducing new material as well, typically at the beginning of class. The classes were longer in some cases. I did actually have the opportunity to take a level six course, which I will say they do recommend that you stay away from level five and level six when going into the UK. I loved my level six. It was probably the most enriching program I've been in personally. So talk with advisors and people here as well as if you can get into contact with a professor there for like level six and harder programs because I personally enjoyed mine. It was a research led program where we got to be introduced to the Georgian papers program that was going on currently and our professor was like a like lead researcher in that department so definitely look for like those more niche experiences i think that's probably one of the most enriching of mine um so one of my favorite memories a few of my friends and i just went to dover we took a train and we spent the whole day there we had no plan so we didn't really know how to get around the area but we just ended up walking like 17 plus miles just exploring the like the cliffs and stuff like that so i do encourage each of you like once you do find your place find those different niche places. And even if you don't have like a specific plan, go figure it out. And probably the less planning you do, the more spontaneous and fun it could be. Um, and then finally, what advice would I have considering a study abroad program? Definitely consult like what credits are transferring back and forth. And if you're specifically trying to do something like major related, talk with an advisor. I know I talked with Dr. Matt Andrews before I left. He was super helpful in telling me what credits would probably transfer. He was typically pretty open. I know the history department can be lenient on some. And he was like, you know what? It's probably going to transfer. Enjoy your time. So I do recommend if you want most of the history faculty who is in the administrative role would definitely talk with you about like, hey, Will this work? Will this work? And they're really, really good at helping you out there. Otherwise, explore into, again, like those level six programs, because some of the other universities can offer something that's a really cool high level course that you don't 
you can have at UNC, but it's also really cool to do it somewhere else and abroad. So I do highly recommend that as well. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Allison. So this is our this is our time for questions. I'm sure Allison would be open to answer questions for you, as would I. Um, the chat is a little bit harder when I'm sharing my screen, so I'd prefer it if you just unmute yourself and ask the question out loud and we'll be able to discuss it. Does anyone have any questions for Allison or for I? For me? So one thing I guess I don't fully understand just in general would be how doing study abroad with a uh, like an external organization works like IES abroad or something like that. Mm -hmm. So uh, IES is a partner organization that focuses only on study abroad. Um, they work with other university partners or they hire their own faculty that are also usually faculty or researchers in other institutions. So how that would work is we have like a general um, application a general brochure for each of our major partners like IES or API. And when you go into that application and apply, you indicate which of the specific programs of theirs that you're interested in. And then it likely will ask you, API, for instance, would ask you to do another application for them as well um, so that you would apply directly to that program, even though the, the application in the Heels Abroad site is generalized. Does that make sense? Yeah. So then would you have to work like specifically with uh, like a study abroad advisor here to make sure you get the correct like credits and everything? Sure. Like so it's not directly. Not... Sorry, go ahead. If it's not like directly through the school. Right, so you can look at the pre-approved courses website, um, which does have a lot of the partner programs in them as well. Um, that would determine if the courses on that program have already been approved by UNC, and then you don't even have to ask the question. Um, but if it's a new course on that program and you understand what that course is, then you go through the credit approval process, which is outlined on the study abroad website. So it would involve working with API to get details about the course to share with your department. Um, and then the department chooses to approve it or not as a certain, um, it usually comes in as a UNC course in that department. Okay, thank you. Sure, no problem. Um, I just saw, I think it was in the, like it was a study abroad email mm -hmm. uh, that passports are taking like 18, 12 or 18 weeks. How does that affect student visas? Oh, they're, they're unrelated, but it will impact you if you don't have your passport now and like you're just getting started with that process now. So if you're hoping to study abroad in the summer, say, I think you should apply for your passport yesterday. <laughs> Um, it's possible that you can expedite your passport. And I actually have heard that the folks who are expediting it are getting it in, in three to five weeks, but that's usually the time without expediting. Um, so I, I'm hoping that they work through that backlog, but I think there are a lot of people who haven't thought about it for a couple of years and are trying to now. So if you are even thinking about studying abroad, go get your passport right away. Um, secondarily, like obviously you'll need enough time to get your visas. Um, for some summer programs, they're not required. Um, for semester programs, they usually are required for your program. So if you're looking to study abroad in the fall, you may or may not need to expedite your passport in order to get your visa. But they, they are unrelated because they're running from different organizations. I hope that helps. Yeah. That, that's great. Good great. Thing. Excellent question. Other questions? Anything for Allison? Awesome. Well, I think I think you did a great job, Allison. Thanks for being here for representing your experience. 
Um, I think you all have so many amazing opportunities in front of yourself. Um, do the research and, and think about the kinds of opportunities, the experiences you want. I think Allison's point of um, identifying unique opportunities that you couldn't otherwise do at Carolina is really the way that I like to think about studying abroad. So even if you will be enrolling in a partner institution, think about that institution's strengths and think about the types of experiences that it can gain you access to that you wouldn't otherwise be able to do on campus. And then think about bringing it back to campus and bringing that experience here to share with the broader community here. So um, I'd like to thank you all for being here and for sharing your questions and sharing this time. Um, make sure you do the research before you reach out and make an appointment with a study abroad advisor. But um, in the meantime, have fun looking for the programs that might fit for you and, and let us know if there's any way that we can support you in this journey. We're really excited to, to send you abroad. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gina. No problem. Thank you.